we are ready to go. Hey, did you guys know that we could have fun in church? I know some of y'all are like, what? Okay, we're gonna play a little game today. And I know all the introverts in the room are slightly cringing, but I want everybody to participate, okay? This game will only be as fun as you make it to be. I didn't even include this in my notes because I didn't want any of the creative team or the worship team or the production team to know ahead of time what we're gonna do. So nobody knows, but please participate, okay? Just humor me because you will have more fun if you participate than if you don't. Now, the way this game works is that I'm gonna say a word and then I'm gonna point to you guys and you're gonna say the first word that comes to mind. It's just a little word association game. Don't try to think about the correct answer. There's no right or wrong answer. Neighbors, if you hear your neighbor saying something that's not appropriate, elbow them in church, okay? So I'm gonna give you a practice round because I know that some people get nervous if they don't have a chance to practice the game. So the first word that I'm gonna say is color. And I'm gonna say the word and then I'm gonna point to you and you say the first color that comes to mind, okay? Are you guys ready? Ready? Okay, color. Okay, awesome. Hey, you guys just talked in church and nobody died. Did you know that you can also talk in church? Okay, church is more fun for both the person up here and for everybody out there if you're contributing. Okay, I'm telling you, it's awesome. Okay, you guys ready for our game? Here we go. Animal. Good job. Sport. Okay, a lot of baseball fans. Hobby. Oh, that one was harder. Okay, that one was harder. Okay, here's an easier one. Food. Okay, pizza, I heard pizza. Okay, family. Love, that was a good one. What about holiday? Okay, it's right around the corner. What about work? Yay! Okay, I think you were the only person who said yay, Pastor Jeremiah. Okay, last one, grand finale, authority. Was that one harder? Oh, that one was harder. Hey, today we are gonna talk about the authority test. We've been a book, uh, in a book called The Proving Ground 2.0. It's by Pastor Kevin Gerald. And I want us to reframe the way we think about tests. Because I think largely the case is when we hear the word test, it has kind of a negative connotation. Like, oh man, I gotta take a test. But the Lord actually delights in seeing us grow. And I don't know about you, but sometimes we need tests in our life to help us grow and mature and prepare us for the next thing, the next season of life. And so in order to be ready for promotion, sometimes we have to go through tests. So I want us to think about this today. It's chapter five in the book called The Authority Test. And I'm just gonna start out by telling you some definitions of authority. Okay, there's a couple different definitions. And the first one is just persons in command. Okay, so you might think of people in positions of authority like the president, maybe your boss, a CEO, uh, a parent, a supervisor, your pastor, a teacher. Okay, those are people who are in charge or in a position of authority because it's either been earned or granted by them, okay? But here's a second definition of authority. It says the power to influence or command thought, opinion, or behavior. So even a book could be an authority in your life, okay? We're gonna talk about that later because some positions of authority are actually just determined by a person's age, or maybe their influence, maybe their area of expertise, their knowledge. So think of people like this, your elders. Those are people in positions of authority. I won't name anybody, but there are a couple pastors on team who like to remind me that I have more gray hair and I'm older than they are. They both happen to have shaved heads and beards. I should just be telling them, hey, I'm your elder. So 
other people in positions of authority might be just an expert, like an expert in a field. You would go to them because they have an authority in that field. An advisor, someone that is mentoring you or teaching you, that might be an authority figure in your life. Or even just a leader, maybe a leader here in church, a small group leader or your team leader, okay? So we all have people in our lives that are authority figures over us. And that's not a bad word. I know that some of us don't like authority, right? I think our society is actually a big proponent of dishonoring and questioning and disrespecting authority. Would you guys agree? If you've lived in Asheville for any period of time, you've probably driven down the road and seen the bumper sticker that literally says, question authority. Has anybody seen that? So our society doesn't just say that it's okay, they're actually telling you to do it. Right, because human nature is, we like to get our own way. Do you guys like to get your own way? Yes, okay, just admit it, get it, get it out of your, off your chest. We like to get our own way. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever had kids, or you've taught kids, maybe you're even a volunteer and rock kids, you know that children love to tell other people what to do, and they do not love being told what to do. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I think adults are sometimes like that too, right? Well, I am not a parenting expert, but I do have four awesome kids. I brought a picture of my kids. Look at these beautiful babies. I love my kids. Can I brag for a minute? I know we're supposed to be humble. I am four for four in raising children who like to distrust and dishonor authority. I'm just saying, if you're not good at math, that's 100% of my children who like to test their boundaries with authority. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It is human nature to want to push back against authority. You do not have to teach kids this life skill. It comes very naturally. Look at this picture of my sweet little baby. She's only 15 months old. Look at those fat little cheeks. I love that girl. She honestly, Cora is such a sweet-natured, gentle, easygoing baby. And can I just tell you, she has already figured out at 15 months old, when she does not like what we're telling her to do, or like if we're at the table and we're like, you're all done, and she doesn't want to be all done with her food, she has already figured out how to stomp her little feet, how to point her finger and tell you what she thinks about it. She will tell her brothers off in her own little language. She can't even string sentences together, but she can lay on the floor and throw a fit. And she did not learn that from anybody in our house, okay? Except for that one time that Eric laid on the floor and threw a fit. (laughs) I'm just kidding, he didn't do that. Only in front of me, not in front of the children. So even at 15 months old, we want our way. We want to do what we think is best. We want to rail against authority. It's human nature. So we don't have to be taught how to dishonor authority. What we have to be taught is how to honor authority. And so I want to talk about that today. How do we honor authority? Uh, You know, I think it's easier to honor people who are in positions of authority when we agree with them, right? When we're getting our way and we like what they're doing and we like what they're saying, but the authority test that Pastor Kevin Gerald is talking about here happens when we are being asked to do something that we don't wanna do, like eat your vegetables, right? Clear your plate, go make your bed. Those are simple little things, but there's something inside of us that likes to rebel. So here we go. What does honor sound like? It sounds like something. If you've been raised in the South, it probably sounds like yes ma'am and yes sir. Y'all know that one? Okay, maybe it sounds like this. Having a positive attitude in a really negative situation. Not only is that honoring to our Father God, but it might be honoring the leader that's asking you to do something that is hard Okay, and remaining positive in a negative situation is a way that we honor people in authority. What about this one? It sounds like the absence 
of grumbling against your leader. Now y'all know that somebody is at work and they always got something to say about the boss, about the president, about somebody they don't agree with, right? But the absence of grumbling sounds like honor, right? And I love the rule personally, if you don't have anything good to say, just don't say anything at all. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with everything, and I I think that the book does a great job. I want to encourage you to go back and read chapter five because it does a great job of talking about what do you do in those hard, tricky situations where maybe an authority figure is not doing the right thing, okay? Because the Bible's not telling us to act immorally or unbiblically under a leader, but the Bible is saying that we get to choose how we respond even in negative situations. What does honor look like? It looks like something. It could be simple as giving up your seat for your elders, right? Again, if you grew up in the South, get up and give your seat to someone else who's older than you. What else does it look like? It might mean that you are being submissive to your direct leader. When they ask you to do something, you just get up and you go do it and other people are watching you to see how you responded. What else does it look like? It means you might comply with a request even when you didn't get your way. So when your boss is asking you to do something that's not fun, hey, will you go clean that toilet? Nobody loves cleaning the toilet. But if your boss asks you to do it, then when you go and do it, that looks like honor. How else does it look? It's the absence of rebellion. Now I'm telling you, I I have four awesome kids and just watching them grow up, I know that it is in our heart to wanna rebel. I know better than that person. What does the Bible say? To be humble. And you may not know every single situation in life and how to interpret if you're honoring or not, but the Holy Spirit can show you, and I think it happens through these tests in life, when you have rebellion in your heart. So I believe that honoring people in positions of authority is something that God asks of us, and it's not just about the behavior of what you're saying or what you're doing, it really is about the posture of your heart. Right? What is in your heart when you are saying yes ma'am or yes sir? What is in your heart when you're giving up your seat to an elder? What is in your heart when you cringe inside because you don't wanna do what your boss or your pastor is asking you to do? When your pastor says, hey, come early and come to prayer on Sunday mornings and you're like, I do not wanna get up early. What is in your heart? Why do you resist? Let the Lord touch that place in your heart, even today. I wanna tell you a story about one of my middle school teachers. Now you may not know, but years ago, over a decade actually, I was a teacher in the classroom. And even in eighth grade, I had kinda already thought I might wanna be a teacher. Well, what in the world was I thinking? No, I'm joking, I love teachers and it is hard work. I love teachers, we love the next generation. Well, here I am in eighth grade, probably a little too big for my britches, and I have this teacher who spent almost two decades teaching in elementary school. I think it was first or second grade. And she was not a great teacher. I don't know what in the world possessed her to think that she was going to enjoy teaching sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Have y'all met those guys before? Talk about resisting authority, right? And so our class, admittedly, not very honoring to her. Super disrespectful, very disruptive, constantly pushing back at her. And I remember if she got mad, she'd take that little Expo marker and she'd throw it across the classroom. (laughs) Oh yes, she did. She had a little green Excedrin bottle and she'd leave it sitting on her desk just in case she ever needed it, which was like every day and she'd slam it on the desk and she'd say, y'all are giving me a headache. And everybody was like slightly terrified of her, but not enough to behave well. And I remember, because I was one of those kids, I loved to learn. And I was like, hey, we're getting ready to go into high school. I wanna do well, I wanna learn. And I remember finally I'd had enough 
of my class and my teacher, and I went home and I told my mom, I'm like, mom, this lady is out of control. She is throwing markers, she is yelling, she is slamming Excedrin bottles down on her desk. We don't learn a thing in this class. But I will never forget what my mom said to me. She said, you're not disrespecting her, are you? Never even thought to say, what, she, no, she did not, I'm gonna come up there and tell her something. No, she turned it back to me and I said, no, I'm, I'm not disrespecting her, I'm trying to learn. And my mom said to me, and it was a life lesson that I still carry with me today, you cannot control how other people behave, including people who are in positions of authority, but you can control how you respond. Thank you, mom. My mom's here this morning, my mom and dad. So I remember thinking, man, I kinda subconsciously wanted my mom to feel sorry for me and, and you know, come to my rescue and go say something to the teacher. And what my mom said is, no, this is on you. And can I tell you, it never got better. That teacher, even <laughs> my younger brother, he had her for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. It never got better. And still, my parents stuck to their story, respect, honor, listen, obey, be submissive. Why? Because that reflects the heart of our Father God. So today, I want, to see, I want us to look at what does God say about authority, okay? So if you're taking notes, here's number one. God's word is an authority for establishing truth. So God's word is an authority for establishing truth. Let's look at this scripture in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's a good word. That scripture means that the Bible is actually the written word of God that is given to us by God to help us navigate life. And all the circumstances of life and all the things that we believe to be true, it's de defined and outlined in the word of God. That Greek word that Paul coined there that means God breathed, it literally means breathed out by God or inspired directly by him. So it, this is a foundational truth we don't get to decide what is right. We don't get to decide what is truth. We use God's word to define that for us. And if we truly believe this scripture, that the entirety of the Bible is actually inspired by God, then we can say this is an authoritative truth and an expression of God himself. Because even back then, people were like, well, the scriptures were written by people who are flawed. And Paul was going, no, no, no. The scripture was actually inspired by God. So this is an important truth because we have to establish that God's word is the standard and the baseline for what we believe. Because guess what? If we don't, we're gonna make up our own version of Christianity that probably isn't Christian, right? Because again, we like to get our own way. And when the Bible tells us to do things that are hard, we're like, well, I think that was just Paul who said that, not Jesus. And when we reframe our mind and we go, no, this word was inspired directly by God, then we can submit ourselves to the authority of God's word, right? Number two, all authority is permitted and established by God. I'm just gonna let that sit there. This one is much harder, I think, for us to agree with. All authority is permitted and established by God. This is what the scripture says in Romans chapter 13, one and two. Everyone, that's excluding no one, must submit to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist are instituted by God. 
So then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. That's pretty powerful. This verse, this uh, scripture here, it actually goes on to talk about pretty hot topics like respect and honor and paying tolls and taxes. Y'all, even in antiquity, people didn't like to pay their taxes. So Paul is addressing stuff here that's heavy, it's hard. And he's saying, listen, I'm gonna make a clear call for all believers to respect people who are in positions of authority. And he even is so bold to say that not a single authority that you find yourselves coming under is there by mistake. They're actually given authority by God. And I know you're probably sitting here going, but what about so-and-so? There ain't no way God put them in authority. Read the scripture. Go back to number one. The Bible is God-breathed and God-inspired. It's the truth, right? And so even if we don't understand this and we're in a situation where it's hard to come underneath an authority figure, when we do that, we are honoring God. And the scripture says that when we don't do that, we're bringing judgment on ourselves, okay? Let's look at number three. Even Jesus submitted to authority. Even Jesus, the perfect son of God, submitted to authority. Now I'm gonna give you some examples here. There's many, many more that you can find in the scripture, so go back. If you're still not sure about what I'm telling you, dig in your Bible, read the word of God, find it out for yourself. Let's look at these examples. Jesus submitted to the authority of his parents, his earthly mom and dad. Here's an example, John chapter two. His first miracle was at the call and the request of his mom. In fact, they're at a wedding and he tells her, it's not my time yet. And yet he made a move in honor of his mom because she made a request of him. Jesus could have said, and I will listen to my heavenly father. And he could have not listened, but he didn't. He listened to his mama. Y'all need to listen to your mamas. I'm gonna tell my kids that. Okay, Jesus submitted to the authority of his heavenly father. Here's another example. John chapter five, verse 19 says, I only do what I see my father doing. So in other words, Jesus' behavior was actually prescripted by his father. He loved and honored his father God so much that he looked to say, what is my father doing? That's what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna make decisions on my own because it's what I think is right. I'm gonna look to my father. He was perfect, right? And yet he submitted to his heavenly father. Here's another one. Jesus submitted to the authority of the law. Jesus paid the temple tax. Let's read this scripture together in Matthew 17, verses 24 through 26. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, hey, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon, he asked. From whom do the kings of earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him, but so that we may not cause offense, go to the lake, throw out your line. Take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and for yours. Hey, who wants Jesus to help us pay our taxes? That's pretty awesome, huh? Now, the reality is, they were trying to catch Jesus and doing something wrong. And so they're looking at, at Jesus and his disciples and they're like, hey, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Well, he obviously hadn't paid it yet. And Jesus goes, hey, who has to pay the, temp, the taxes and the tolls, the king's children? No, no, no. So he was making a statement, my father is the king. 
I have no obligation to pay the tax. And yet, because I don't want to offend other people, I'm going to submit. Jesus, who had a reason to say, I'm going to do what I think is right, he still submitted to authority. That's pretty powerful. Look at this other example. He submitted to the authority of the government. Ooh, I know somebody does not like that. Jesus was living in a situation and in a time that the Roman government was actually tyrannical. And the people were looking for a Messiah to come overthrow the government. And yet Jesus recognized the people in positions of authority even right before his death. So let's look at this scripture in John chapter 19, verses 10 and 11. So Pilate said to him, you're not talking to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Now in the verses just before, Pilate's asking Jesus questions and he stands there silently. This is what Jesus says to him. You would have no authority over me Jesus answered him, if it hadn't been given to you from above. This is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Jesus knew at this point in his life that he was headed to the cross. He knew Pilate's position of power. He knew that Pilate could have released him or crucified him. And yet Jesus is looking at Pilate and he's going, you know what? The only reason you have authority over me is because it was given to you by my father. So again, back to that same idea. All authority is permitted and instituted by God. Even Jesus submitted himself to the authority of both God and man. And the reason he did that was so that you and I could experience salvation. When he was submitting himself to the authority of Pilate, he knew that it was literally gonna cost him his life. And yet he was willing. He was willing to submit to authority. Why? Because he ultimately knew that it was part of God's plan. That's a powerful kind of trust when we are willing to submit ourselves to people who are in positions of authority because we're ultimately going You're only an authority because God permitted it. And if knowing that, I can trust my life and my future with my Father God. It's really good. Let's look at number four as we're coming to a little bit of a close. God's command to respect authority came with a promise. Came with a promise. Exodus 20, verse 12 says, Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. Here's the scripture from the Old Testament. Here it is again in the New Testament, Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Why? So that it may go well with you and you may live a long life on the earth. It's beautiful. The very first people who are in position of authority in your life are your parents. And I realize that that's a hard subject for some people because some of us, like myself, have incredible parents who love and support you and protect you and guide you. But I also know that a lot of us have had parents that weren't there for you. And yet what the Word of God is saying in both the Old and the New Testament is to honor your authority, honor your mom and dad. And that God was so good that when he said to do that, to honor your father and mother, when we comply, there's a promise attached to it. And so what he says is, if you honor your parents, then it will go well with you and you'll live long. What about the antithesis of that statement? What happens when you don't honor your parents? And I think for some of us, because maybe you were raised in a home where life was hard growing up, it's hard to imagine 
that a good God who loves you so much would place you in an environment or in a home where maybe people didn't protect you. And it was hard to submit to their authority. Hey, the reality is, regardless of how awesome your childhood and your upbringing was, or how difficult it might have been, there's still that sin nature in all of us that wants to resist and push back and dishonor. But God is saying, I've put people in your life to help you grow. I've put people in your life that sometimes will push you. I've put people in your life, not just your parents, but your pastors who love you, your leaders, your small group leader, your boss at work, your elders. I've put these people in your life for a purpose. And when we are willing to humbly come, not just before that person, but before the Lord and say, I'm gonna submit, I'm gonna honor, I'm gonna respect even when it's hard. When we do that, it's ultimately honoring our Father God. And we have the life of Jesus to look at because he did that with both God and man. When we submit ourselves to authority, we're submitting ourselves to our Father God. And we're saying, I trust you. I trust you, God, with my life. I trust you, God, with my family. I trust you, God, with my future. I trust you, Lord, in my job. I trust you, God, with my calling. I trust you, Lord, in my finances. And when we submit ourselves to God and we trust Him, something beautiful happens. And even if your circumstance, your situation doesn't change, just like my eighth grade year, where I still had to go through that whole year that I felt like was chaotic, God still worked in me. And now, as a grown adult, I can still think back to that time, and I'm grateful that my parents said, honor, respect, submit, make the decision. I believe that in the end, regardless of whatever kind of circumstance you might be going through, that God's purposes will be fulfilled. And when you cling to that word and you say, God, I don't know exactly what's going on in my life or in my future. I don't know exactly why you have me under this leader or in this situation, but I trust you. Even if the circumstance doesn't change, your heart can. I love how in the book, Kevin Gerald talks about this and he says, God is looking for our response to authority. And there are situations, like I said, that maybe are really difficult. Maybe you do have to actually make a move. I wanna encourage you, again, go back in your word, go back in the book. I think he does a great job of saying, what do you do when your leader is acting immorally? How do you respond and honor God in that way and in those circumstances? But ask yourself today, what is my heart's posture toward people who are in positions of authority. Maybe it's actually your mom and dad, even as an adult. Maybe it's a boss. Maybe you have a work situation that feels awkward or hard. Maybe you are being asked to do things that you don't wanna do or that are hard. Maybe it is your pastors. When pastor comes up here and he pleads with us, come to First Wednesday prayer, pray with us, come early to church. He's not just doing that for his own good. He's doing it for your good. He's doing it for my good. You're gonna have opportunities in your life. If you're not walking through this test right now, you either already have or you're going to, or both. Because authority figures will always be in our lives. Again, the government. Everybody has something to say about it, but the word of God is very clear. Submit, honor, respect. It doesn't mean you have to agree, but you can pray for them. It doesn't mean you have to like it, but you can go to the Father God and say, God, send somebody in their path that will show them the truth of your way. I wanna pray with us today God, we are so grateful that you are a good father, 
that you put people in positions of authority in our lives for a purpose and a reason that we may not even see or understand or feel. But God, we know that your word is true. We know that we can trust you, that we can trust you with our life and our future and our families and our jobs. And so Lord, I'm praying today that every single one of us will have a humility of heart, that we would be willing ultimately to submit to your authority to the authority of your word, of what you are telling us and teaching us. But also, God, we would submit to people who are in positions of authority, to our parents, to our teachers, to our pastors, our leaders, our bosses. God, teach us how to be respectful, how to be positive, how to trust you with every area of our life, knowing that ultimately your purposes will be true and will come to pass. God, help us not to be rebellious in nature and to rail against authority figures, but to really be honoring in our words and in our actions and in our hearts. You might be sitting here today and you go, that sounds like a great idea, but I don't even know how to do that. The very first decision to make is that in order to be submissive to authority here on the earth, you gotta submit to the Father. And if you've never made that decision to follow Jesus, to surrender your life to His Lordship and to His power and His authority, that's the decision you need to make today. And He will take care of all the rest. There's nothing that intimidates Him about your circumstance. And so I wanna ask you today, if that's you, and you're going, I want to surrender my life to the Lordship and the goodness of Jesus. Because I know he made that decision to go to the cross so that I did not have to live with pain and suffering, but instead live in incredible freedom. I wanna ask you to raise your hand and we're gonna pray over you right here in this moment to make that decision today. All over the room, God bless you. God bless you, I see your hand. Hey, will you just pray this prayer aloud for me and with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for submitting to your Father. Thank you for going to the cross, for bearing my sin and my shame so that I could experience true freedom. Lord, Today I submit my life to your Lordship. Help me become the person that you created me to be. Amen. Hey, can we just celebrate that two people just made that decision right now in this moment? That's awesome.